Hello friends, and welcome to my new video, in which I'll tell you some amazing stories. But before we begin, please subscribe to my channel and hit the like button on this video. Also, don't forget to write your thoughts about these stories down in the comments. Let's get started. The first story is, Jerk cheated on my friend, so I fired him and made his life a living hell. Context. Eileen, not her real name, and my mom have been best friends since they were little. And to me, Eileen has always been a kind of aunt. Eileen's husband of over 25 years shocked her around five years ago when he suddenly filed for divorce. Since I was out of state and Eileen was roughly six hours away from my mother at the time, I didn't learn the full story until several months after their divorce was officially finalized. Since Eileen's ex-husband, Jeff, not his real name, again, hadn't discussed any issues with her before filing for divorce, she felt like he had fallen out of love. However, I was not all that convinced by what Eileen told me. A year before their breakup, Jeff, a mid-six-figure executive at a pharmaceutical firm, was sacked from his position. He then chose to take a break before seeking for another employment. I found it strange that Jeff, who had always been such a workaholic, chose to take a break from his job. Due to her infirmity, Eileen hasn't worked in years, but she's able to live a good life without working because to some property and a trust her parents gave her. During his unemployment, Jeff and Eileen survived off the money from that trust. Jeff finally moved out of state, but to a state where he had no relatives or connections, very shortly after the divorce was finalized. Since Jeff is very close to his parents, who are in their 80s and 90s, I didn't see why, if he wanted to move after the divorce, he wouldn't move to be nearer to them. I had a suspicion that Jeff was having an affair. He had staged his unemployment to avoid paying alimony and had moved out of the state to be with his mistress. But I didn't want to confront Eileen about it. I simply lacked the means to verify it at this moment. The Examine Trees Afterwards, Eileen asked me to locate a box that contained items that Jeff had asked her to hold for him while he moved into a new apartment. She provided me the passwords to his computer so I could read the email and told me everything about this box, its contents, and his new address that he had supplied her. Here's where I got lucky. Jeff had, as it turned out, set up his email on her computer and used it. Unintentionally, while looking for Eileen's email, I clicked on the app for his. I made the decision to glance through his email. He had largely stopped using that email account about three years prior, which was roughly a year before he was fired. And that was the first thing I noticed. I believe he unintentionally stored a confirmation email for a dating service. I can't recall if it was Match or POF. In a folder containing digital receipts. A new email verification email was also discovered by me. I started creating a hypothetical chronology of the events. Based on my estimation, Jeff initiated an affair approximately three years prior, and soon after, he made the decision to obtain a new email address in order to conceal the affair. I attempted to use the Forgot Password tool to see if I could create an email that would enable me to reset the password and log in that way in order to access his dating profile and obtain further information. Regretfully, Jeff's previous email address was not recognized by this dating website. I reasoned that I could use his old email to reset the password on Jeff's new email and then maybe use the new email to log into the dating site. However, until I know more about what Jeff has done, I really didn't want to take the chance of notifying him and locking him out of his new email. Here's where I got really lucky. Super smart Jeff saved certain passwords on notes using the notes feature on the email client he downloaded to Eileen's MacBook. Although I was able to obtain the passwords for his Twitter and Netflix accounts, dating site and dating website, most of the passwords were useless. But I entered the password in his new email address to log on to the dating site. Before he broke up with Eileen, Jeff sent texts to another woman, which I was able to read. 
In one of the texts, the new mistress gave Jeff her email address. I discovered the mistress's page on Facebook and searched for her email address. The mistress posted pictures online, but I was unable to decipher what she wrote. I knew that they were still dating since she had updated pictures of herself and Jeff together. In addition, she sent a picture of a building crew starting work on a new house for her and Jeff. This was intriguing because Eileen had given me the idea that Jeff wasn't wealthy following their divorce. This is where having my background matters. During my legal residency, I spent a semester in my hometown while attending law school. And during that time, I had access to the public records database of Lexis. I understood how to look for public records because I had spent a significant amount of one of my summer internships locating assets and property records to aid in the recovery of judgments for clients. The mistress had bought many acres in an affluent suburb and there was no mortgage on file some months prior to Jeff's divorce filing. Since I had already located the mistress's LinkedIn profile, I knew that prior to moving out of state with Jeff, she had been an executive assistant. Additionally, I discovered in a recent document in Lexis that listed Jeff and the mistress as co-owners of the property. In order to verify dates, ownership of the property, etc., I gave the county recorder office a call. Less than five weeks after Jeff's divorce was finalized, the mistress filed a quit claim. Before attempting to access Jeff's new email, I thought it would be best to check his old one one more time, see if there was anything else that I should look into. Although I couldn't locate anything, I did see that some passwords in his notes were identical. I made the decision to attempt logging into his new email account with the password he used on the dating website. Since the two accounts were probably created at the same time, I reasoned that the most plausible explanation for the password reuse was that he had recycled it. And it succeeded. That fresh email of his was pure treasure. Since this tale is already growing unnecessarily lengthy, I'll enumerate some of the most pertinent materials I discovered. Jeff was still employed at his previous position. He told Eileen lies and that he quit. His administrative email, which I discovered, asked where his final payment should be sent and included information about a farewell party. Two, a few emails suggesting a leak on one side of the sailboat close to the engine compartment were sent between Jeff and a yacht repair specialist. The repairman was unable to locate the leak's source, but he did discuss the mold and engine issues that are present and could arise in the future. 3. Email correspondence between Jeff and a boat broker that had buyer's email addresses further down the chain. 4. An email report from the boat inspector that omitted information about the leak, mold growth, and possible engine damage. And 5. Email exchanges between Jeff and his contractor over modifications to the sunroom of their new home. Something about a three-season versus a four-season sunroom and the need to adjust the building to handle the weight of snow. The mistress and Jeff's emails? They were wed. Jeff and the mistress exchanged a calendar. A few flirtatious emails exchanged by Jeff with another woman. Emails outlining Jeff's new job. After downloading all of the pertinent emails and their attachments, I began formulating a plan of retaliation. Everything was fair game, in my opinion. I wanted him dismissed from his new work because he had lied about being fired. I wanted him to lose his house since I felt like he had hidden his money before splitting from Eileen so that he didn't have to pay her and to assist pay for his new residence. And I wanted to ruin his new relationship because he had cheated. It'd be a bonus if I could do anything about the boat as well. The boat was the most convenient place to begin. I didn't know if the leak source was located and fixed or if it was told to the buyer verbally, but I reasoned that since Jeff was a dishonest person, it was likely that he had withheld the information from the new buyer. I provided the buyer a copy of the inspection, along with the emails that were exchanged between Jeff and the repairman. Five or six months later, I looked up Jeff on the county court website and discovered that the buyers had sued him along with the broker and the inspector. Hey, would you look at that? Since I was unable to steal Jeff's house, or demolish it, 
I had to make do with complaining about the non-compliant sunroom to the county inspector's office. I recently learned more facts about what transpired with the county inspectors, which is essentially what inspired me to write this essay. Note, I am not familiar with all the specifics. I learned about this through a third party years after the incident. The inspector discovered a workshop or workroom attached to the unattached garage that wasn't on the original permit or blueprints, but it turned out that the sunroom complied with the codes. Following the initial inspection, the contractor connected the workshop's bathroom to the septic system of the property. Eileen and I were informed by a mutual friend of Jeff and Eileen that this was a huge concern, since, I don't know for sure, the septic system they installed wasn't large enough to handle the extra input. A fine was imposed on Jeff, and the workshop had to be taken down. Construction was ultimately delayed as a result of this, which will be important later. In terms of ruining Jeff's marriage, my initial thought was to forward the flirtatious emails that Jeff and that other lady exchanged, but I was unable to locate that woman on social media. I was unable to ascertain whether the new spouse was aware of the previous spouse and would interpret the emails as insignificant or proof of an extramarital affair. I then entertained the notion of sending something to Jeff's wife and upgrading his dating profile. However, creating a fictitious relationship with actual dates and time would take way too much time, and I was concerned also that Jeff could receive an email alert from the dating site that would reveal the truth to him. I ultimately just took a chance that the new wife would be unaware of the previous one. I acted as though I was worried that Jeff and the new woman were having an affair. I said that Jeff and the new girl went on a couple of dates to the movies and out to dine, but I otherwise left the accusation ambiguous. According to their shared calendar, Jeff's new wife was out of town. I was unable to think of a method to fire Jeff. Over a few weeks, I went through his schedule and emails again, searching for something that I could use to try and get him fired. I eventually decided to just let it go because my legal residency became way too hectic for me to spend that much time seeking retribution. But after recently getting back in touch with a buddy she had with Jeff, Eileen received an update on Jeff. It was after Eileen gave me the specifics that I was reminded of what I had done and inspired this story. As it happened, I didn't have to be concerned about ruining Jeff's career. Fortunately, the woman Jeff had been texting was his boss's assistant at work, and Jeff's brother-in-law was now his boss. In order for her to be near her family and for Jeff to start working for his new brother-in-law, Jeff and his new wife actually relocated to her hometown. I don't know if Jeff was indeed unfaithful. He clarified that they haven't been having an affair to their mutual buddy who told Eileen about this story. However, the new wife didn't care. She didn't have that much faith in Jeff because they started dating when Jeff was already married. When I submitted the email revealing Jeff's infidelity, she didn't buy his protestations. She made a divorce filing and the boss of Jeff's brother-in-law immediately dismissed him. Additionally, when Jeff and his new wife were divorced, the new house wasn't built because the work was delayed. When they had to sell an unfinished house, Jeff's finances suffered greatly. Ultimately, these were not a part of my bigger plan of retaliation, but since I'm a petty person, I took the box containing Jeff's belongings, which were primarily pictures, and hid them. They must have been misplaced during the relocation, I informed Eileen. I signed up to several spam emails, newsletters, mailing lists, etc., using both of Jeff's email addresses. And I made his Netflix watch list completely disappear. That is an ungodly amount of computer crime and fraud for revenge like this. I I've lost count of how many laws and regulations you've broken here. That guy's definitely a B, but you definitely should not have put yourself in danger and at risk with the law to try and get back at him like this. The last thing I would want to see in a lawyer is a lawyer who breaks the law to solve a problem. It, it'd be a shame if something went wrong and he ruined your life, too. And it could be very detrimental to your law school experience. I don't know. I don't think it was worth the risk. You could have retaliated in a different way, within the confines of the law. I like the whole revenge thing, but it wouldn't have been much easier or more beneficial and lawful 
for Eileen to reveal his hidden assets and then pay her more alimony or compensation. It would have been safer for you and much more profitable for Eileen, who was the number one affected party in this situation. Anyway, glad you brought him some retribution somehow. The next story is, HOA destroyed my house while I was on vacation. But I'm not even a member of the HOA. I've lived in my comfortable house on the outskirts of my town for more than 20 years. Even though I've lived there for more than 20 years, my house has been on this street for much longer. It is the oldest house on this entire street. I was told that when this house was built, it was the first, not just on our street, but it was the first in the whole neighborhood. Although now my house is not the only one and I have many neighbors. Some of them are a-holes. Some of them are very cool people with whom I am friends. About seven years ago, something that we can call an HOA appeared near my property. At that time, it was not yet an officialized HOA and everyone knew it. It was just that some neighbors decided to be leaders in at least something, so they made their own HOA. I immediately refused any cooperation with this fake HOA. My friends were all very skeptical about the idea of an HOA, and even more so about the idea of an HOA in a neighborhood like ours, because it's not really a big neighborhood. All the people have systematic garbage collection, People don't have very big territories, so they don't need help to take care of their land, etc. And just for the record, most people believed that in 99% of cases, HOAs are something that will only make your situation worse, not help you. At one point, this HOA, which I, again, am not a part of, started talking very actively about me and my private property. At this point, by the way, I installed cameras on my property so that they covered almost every corner of my land and house. They especially talked a lot about my old oak tree. This oak is estimated to be about 125 years old. I would also like to add that this HOA tried for months to get me to become part of them. I just ignored their letters. But once, I went on a vacation. I really enjoyed it. I had a really great time with my wife because I hadn't had a vacation for a long time. I'd only been working. My heart broke when I came home from vacation. The HOA had cut down my oak tree, which fell on my house and made my house uninhabitable. These a-holes also forgot their branded stuff on my land and then, in hindsight, pretended that the wind knocked it down. But more on that later. I called the police, told my wife to wait for them, and immediately ran to my lawyer because he lived ten minutes away. It was hard for me to say anything to him because I had no strength left. We just drove away in his car, and he understood everything. The police had already arrived by then, but they gave us nothing but recommendations. At that moment, representatives of the Housing Association came out and said that it was probably the wind that knocked it down and made sly faces. That is, they didn't even try to hide who did it. We filed a lawsuit for the illegal destruction of my private property, illegal entry into my territory when I was not at home. By the way, at the moment, I was living with my sister's sister because my house was uninhabitable. At that time, the lawyer had already examined all the documents, studied the video from the cameras, and realized that we had a pretty great chance of winning. Unfortunately, some of the videos from my cameras were broken due to technical problems after the oak tree fell, but the main videos luckily remained. I, along with professional appraisers and my lawyer, assessed everything that was destroyed by the HOA. We must also not forget that this all has not only monetary value, but also that this is my home, where I have lived for a long time, spent many moments of my life there, and left many of my memorabilia inside that house that were broken by the fall of this oak tree. We estimated the damage at about $1,377,965. During the case, we found many more violations of this HOA and provided evidence to the court. 
Our case became very popular in the media because a million dollar fine is quite colossal, as well as the fact that the HOA destroyed the house of a person who's not even a part of the HOA, and no one even said anything to this person. When the court had not even announced the verdict, some people fled our city. The police are already looking for them. The court was fair. They were obliged to pay me what we asked them to pay, namely the $1,377,965, and they also had to pay for the work of the lawyers. Thanks to the court, this HOA was disbanded. Some people are now in jail. Some people sold their houses to avoid seeing me and to have to pay something to me. By the way, all of those who escaped were eventually found and received their punishment. Now my house is built almost from scratch in some parts, but it's completely restored. It took a little bit of time, but I'm pretty happy about it. The next story is, manager at the IT company thought that I was redundant. Life taught him a lesson that he was wrong. I was a sales engineer in the technology industry, assisting sales representatives about 20 years ago. The field team was joined by a new sales representative manager who objected to the sales engineer's authority over the sales process. He chose to use me as an example of his genius because I was the lead sales engineer. Without using any sales engineers at all, he closed a very big contract after obtaining a very big lead from a bank. He called shortly after the contract completed, gloating that it was the biggest deal of the month. Oh, wait, you didn't participate at all? Well, after about a month, that manager calls me in a panic, and I participate in a conference call with the customer. It's been determined that I must attend this meeting at the corporation. During the discussion, I discover that the customer was offered an incompatible set of solutions by the sales manager and the sales representative, who completely messed up. I jokingly suggest at the meeting that the customer might be able to return one item and exchange it for another, as they were about the same price. The sales manager started berating me after the meeting for bringing up price, even though it was just the sales representative's domain. He takes a crap all over me and calls my manager. My manager didn't sit well with me, so when he sided with the sales representative, I said, screw you, and I just resigned. I sent HR a long-winded defense of what I did during the meeting. I receive a call four months later from a different sales representative who's still employed by this organization. He asks, Hey, what happened at XYZ Bank? They're suing us. I give XYZ Bank a call, obtain the CIO's email address, and then send them a letter stating that I worked as a sales engineer for the business that you are suing. Please give me a call. Eventually, they dispatched a lawyer to speak with me and hear my version of the events. My testimony was devastating to the defense of my previous employer. I presented the bank with a letter that I had sent to my HR department, claiming that our company lied to the customer to try and get a sale. Eventually, the attorneys for my former employer summoned me to testify in the bank versus company lawsuit. By then, I was working for another firm touting the company's stock on Yahoo stock chat boards, hanging out in general. One day, a sales representative from a far-off zone with whom I was still in contact called to inform me that a significant contract we had been working on for more than a year had abruptly collapsed. I put it on the Yahoo discussion board just for that stock. The following day, the stock fell by $13. I questioned whether my post was related to it. About six weeks after the stock market fall, the day before I was scheduled to testify in the bank versus company case, I receive a lawsuit from the company. They had obtained my name from Yahoo using the slap laws, and they're suing me for the post that caused their stock to plummet. I'm sorry, the company you represent today just served me with a lawsuit last night. This deposition is over. I remarked when I arrived at the deposition the following day, and they were in complete disbelief. It turns out that the corporation had two distinct legal teams working on different projects, one on discovering the online troll responsible for the stock drop, and the other on defending the company against the bank's lawsuit. And neither team realized that the same person was at the center of both. 
Soon after, the corporation negotiated with the bank and withdrew its lawsuit against me. It appears that the supervisors above me did not read the lengthy letter that I sent to HR. The sales representative, the sales manager, and his manager were all let go when the litigation was concluded. They have no right to sue you for a publication you authored only to make a point, so good job with that response. It also has legal protections. I just love stories like this where overconfident managers who think they can win without a valuable employee fails. Without technical assistance to point out the very obvious errors in their BS, it's frankly astonishing what the sales department can come up with. Even though I lack any technical training, I believe I could probably handle the X is incompatible with Y message. Very impressive. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder, subscribe, like, and comment.